So when Andreessen Horowitz funds a new networking company or a new uh, disruptive startup that builds stuff for data centers, I want to see it because I work at Rackspace and that might affect our lives here. And uh, we have one of those companies right here. It's called Cumulus Networks and we're going to see what's so disruptive and what Mark Andreessen saw in this company right now. <laughs>
this platform. So you're not the hardware guy in China no. or in Silicon Valley that's putting together these what we call white boxes, right? Right, or bare metal, yeah. Bare metal, yeah. right? You're the software that sits on the networking infrastructure that enables me to go around buying it from Cisco or whatnot yeah. and save a lot of cost, but then get innovation because you're based on, a, on Linux, which is continuing to evolve because it's open source, right? right? And then I can r run my workloads on top of that. Right, exactly, and you can, you know, if you look at it from a deployment inf you know, perspective, I, I know Rackspace has, you know, your teams, you know, a bunch of really bright people to figure out how you want to deploy equipment in a data center, yep. and lots of other companies go up and do that, whether it's a small web, two, you know, 2.0 or an enterprise or a big massively scaled data center, they all have an op way that they want to make their operations run. And in servers, people are pretty efficient these days. Like I mean, when you look at your Rackspace cloud, I bet you're hyper efficient in terms of how your admins have automated that infrastructure. Yep. On the networking side, it's not nearly as automated right now because you know, people like you know, the big C company have stood in the way of that and locked up that user interface. You have to use their CLI and you don't get access to that big broad tool now, set. Now what's your, I've interviewed the NYSERA guys who are building right. software to find networks. Yeah. And they got bought by VMware. What, what's different from you than from NYSERA? Yeah, great, great question. Um, just to clarify and set the stage, NYSERA builds uh, logical networks. So if you have two virtual machines or two physical machines or, or 20 or whatever that live in a, in a large 100,000 node data center that you talked about, it allows you to say, okay, these 20 machines talk to each other in a layer two domain. And to get in and out of that layer two domain, you're going to go through this gateway. Maybe it's an intrusion detection system or a firewall or whatever. But they do that in a, in a logical way on top of the physical network. Okay, we build that physical network. Got it. So we help people build that 100,000 node network, you know, get to full bisection bandwidth or even over provision the core so that all that extra back and forth is transparent to the users of those virtual machines or physical machines. If I'm paying, a, you know, I don't know, a 50 grand for my networking infrastructure today, what kind of cost savings would I see with your with your approach? Yeah, so it's interesting. The on the capital expense side of things, what we're seeing is it's like a, a you know a one to three cost reduction or, or better depending on the customer. Right, so you know, it's so a third. Fifty becomes uh, fifteen or something like yeah, that. Yeah, fifty becomes fifteen. Wow. Um, and that's on the network switching side. On the optics side and the cable side, it's actually a little bit bigger than that. It's like a one to six type reduction to what customers are really paying. Okay, th okay. that's why I'm seeing you. Yes, <laughs> right. <laughs> I, yeah, and and there, I mean, a, a lot of it. I mean, this is this is high quality hardware. It's shipping in super volume. You know, to, you know, through other OEMs or other. You know, other vehicles and being used in, in a lot of environments. Um, the silicon itself comes from people like Broadcom or now Intel's getting into the game. So it's, it's industry standard silicon. So, you know, the optics are industry standard optics. Cables are industry standard cables. You're just eliminating middlemen yeah. in, the, in the way. And this, this is all, uh, we like uh, Open Compute, which is Facebook's uh, right. open source standard that they created a foundation to create these open source data right. centers so that lots of people can innovate and we have a standard way of you know, defining Building new hardware, racks, right, yeah. new hardware, new kinds of things. This is all, com this is all compliant with open compute, right? There's yeah, it's getting there. Let me, I'm going to finish answering your question and we'll go back to some open compute stuff because there's a little, they're doing a lot of really cool things right now. Um, on the kind of OpEx and software side of things, um, you know, we're, our business model is a subscription, so you're going to pay a, a, a subscription. But we're an operating system company, so the way you think about it is it's kind of like how you might think of Red Hat or, or Windows when you put it on a server. It's a fractional cost of hardware. It's not a massive multiple of hardware cost. Yeah. And, so when you, and we do all the frontline support. If something busts, you call us up and say, hey, this doesn't work, or hey, I want to architect my network. What's a good idea? Or, you know, I want to use these tools. How does it work? That, that's what we do. You know, we're, we're an operating system company. But when you look at what someone will pay, you know, a traditional networking company for support and, and ongoing, you know, that the right to continue to use their products, um, our costs are, you know, less than a sixth, you know, almost to an eighth of what you would pay a traditional wow. company. So the, the cost re the cost reduction to a, any one customer is phenomenal. And most of the people we've worked with look at that and say, okay, great, I'm going to put some of that in my pocket, but most of that, I'm going to turn back into more capacity. I'm just going to build a great, a much better network than I would have built yesterday. 
No, that, that's true, or it, which means more customers can get on a certain kind of resource, right? Right. And uh, which means costs go down for everybody, or capabilities go up, et yeah. cetera, et cetera. Right. And we're seeing that in the industry. Uh, you know, lots of people are lowering prices and causing a price war. And uh, so we're very interested in what you're doing. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I mean, if you, there's if a lot of pressure on us. I, my, you know, I had breakfast with my CEO. He's like, man, there's a lot of pressure on me to raise <laughs> profits and, uh, and keep costs down and keep reducing the cost to keep people from going to other cloud comp right. computing. Uh, well, it helps. Competitors. This, this type of capacity increase helps people change the way they think about their current state of affairs. Yeah. You know, if, if you look at a, a Sandy Bridge, you know, class, a current Intel class server, and you kind of run Amdahl's, one of Amdahl's laws on it, you know, with two hertz of compute, it should be a, a hertz of memory bandwidth and hertz of I.O., those puppies should be running 40 gig Ethernet, you know, in and out of them. But nobody's doing that today. Very few. Some of our customers are actually running, you know, 20 or 40 gig out of their servers because they can afford that capacity, but most people aren't doing that today. And when you talk to a, a network architect or a system architect, they realize that they should be, they just can't afford it now. And when you flip that around and say, okay, what if I was running 40 gig? Then they realize, well, yeah, you know, all of a sudden distributed IP storage becomes much more realistic. You know, I can, I, my clustered applications get a lot easier. I worry less about traffic engineering. I can build bigger clusters. All those things that drive characteristics that didn't exist before become available. Very interesting. Keep yeah. talking. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, well, you asked about those. I, you know, this kind of video, you know, there's some videos I do with consumer electronic, consumer stuff that millions of people watch. This one, I, I, I only care about two or three people watching this video. <laughs> <laughs> it's the people who buy the networking infrastructure or rack space that I want to talk to. But there's lots of people who are building open stack deployments inside data centers, inside their own yeah. data centers, or, or uh, have competitors that are interested in what you're doing. Right. Um, Back to open compute. So you're yeah. you're completely uh, your uh, stack is open com compute compliant, or if I put it in, am I out of compliance? Or well, it, we're we're actually working with those quite quite a bit. They they've opened a, a networking pillar in open compute recently, okay. and there's um, there's kind of a fundamental goal of that, which is to be able to have um, a set of of hardware that can be kind of speci specified and reasonably well understood and then given out to the industry. And in specifying that hardware, these guys are, are actually think doing the industry a great service and trying to not say how, what it has to do. It's not like, okay, you need to have this protocol and that protocol and, and like down to the, the nitty gritty detail. They're just saying, here's the hardware platform and we want people to write software that runs on these hardware platforms. Yeah. Now, when you think about it from a server perspective, we do that all the time, right? You can put, you can buy a server from HP, Dell, or Supermicro and put Red Hat on it, or Windows Server, or Ubuntu, or whatever OS you want. And you can do that because they're open platforms, and there's a, a way to install things. Kind of dumb stuff, right? BIOS does certain things, Pixie does certain things, Gpixie does stuff. Networking platforms are all bottled up. You can't get into those things. So we worked with Big Switch actually and, and contributed this piece of technology we call the Open Network Install Environment, or ONI, to Open Compute. And what it does is it kind of comes up in one of these switches on the management part of it, and all it does is like a little tiny kernel, and all it does is looks around for something. So I'm gonna tell me what you want to install. So it goes up and finds something and installs the operating system on top of the switch. Yeah. So the switch can come out of the factory not knowing whose operating system's running on it. It's completely agnostic. You can, you know, in the deployment environment, you plug it in, finds its operating system, installs it. It also has a really cool obvious feature, which is an uninstall. So you can uninstall it to put something else on if you want. Yeah. Um, if uh, that C company was here, the salesperson yeah. from that C company, how does he sell against you? Because <laughs> is it just, hey, I'm Cisco and I'm big and I, I, I'm the safe choice? And is that how he does that? Or does he say, oh, well, my equipment can do something you can't? I mean, pragmatically, it's going to be all the above. I, you know, I was there for 16 years, so I know the game and the playbook pretty well. So it's going to be, you know, we're Cisco, we're never disappearing. Um, we ha look at my products. I have this massive portfolio that you don't have. It's going to be, um, yeah, we're, we're going to do that someday. We're, we're working on that right now because we have, you know, hundreds of thousands, or, you know, tens of thousands of engineers that are working on things. Um, so they're going to go at us in, in all those directions. Yeah. Um, we think the alternative view of this is 
we kind of approach the industry and realize that at some point in time that network operating system is just, we'll call it a, a cog in the machine. You know, you talked about open stack deployments, yeah. right? You know, if, if you want to go out and if you're an open stack, you know, company and you want to, a consulting company, you want to deploy hardware at, at a customer's, maybe even hosted at Rackspace, you know, you go through and you want to be able to specify a hardware bomb, soup to nuts in the rack, and so that your customer can go off, buy the hardware, get it installed, get it cabled up, okay? Right now, there's this networking device is actually a big hole there because you have to buy like a Cisco or an Arista or a Juniper or whatever and stick it in that rack, and that kind of locks up that rack flavor and, and who you can go to for all your components, right? The servers you can get from anybody, but this networking thing becomes fixed. Well, now all of a sudden, the networking hardware fits into that same mental model of the bomb purchase. And then the, you know, the, our OpenStack partner can come in and deploy all the software, the, you know, the server OS, the, cert, the hypervisor, the vSwitch, the network OS, which we want it to be ours, but maybe it's not, but you know, we'd love it to be ours. And then they deploy their software on top of it. So now they can orchestrate and own that whole thing soup nuts. So when their customers come to talk to them, they, ex you know, they say, hey, look, my OpenStack thing is working or it's not working. Now the OpenStack provider has visibility because they, they, they understand every component inside and out there. Yep. And that's why we believe in open cloud, right? Yeah. It's, it, by giving you ac access to the source code, you can see what it's doing. Right. And, and change it and innovate and be more flexible. It really is that simple, yeah. And you can innovate way faster than any one company can by themselves separately, right? Okay. You know, in our case, the uh, that Linux framework allows you know customers to d deploy you know little agents and, and maybe it's a, a DHCP server or whatever. But they just pop it in there. It's a standard DHCP server. They run it, and it serves a, an orchestration purpose for them that they couldn't do otherwise. Let's say Rackspace moved a, a quarter of its data centers to your approach. Do they? What do we need to do internally? Do we need to retrain our network? Uh, administrators? Do we need to rethink our architectures? What, what, what mind shift do we have to make? Where, where it, does it work just like that Cisco box? It, it pretty much works like a Cisco box, grossly, um, like a, from a functional perspective. There are certain features that, you know, Cisco is very much a layer two Ethernet kind of company, and so they spend a lot of time, you know, trying to fix problems that there. And we're, we're, you know, while we support a lot of bridging features, we're not fixated on that. We're kind of more focused on higher scale IP features. Yeah. Um, we don't have a Cisco CLI, so if people are CLI jockeys, you know, they have to learn how to be Linux jockeys. But I mean, if you're going to learn how to jockey something, you might as well learn how to jockey Linux instead of CLI, right? Yeah. That's a much more useful tool set. We love Linux. We have hundreds of Linux engineers. Right. right. So then your guys are you know, happy little campers when they touch one of these things. Any, any Linux sysadmin that we give a box to, they just flip out and they're just they're off to the races. Okay. Um, What's the, uh, I think you had an architecture slide. The way we think about our solution, you know, every day we talk about this, you know, when we make technical decisions, is we want to hardware accelerate the Linux kernel. Yeah. So it's really easy to decide, um, I want to add some new feature and some new function. And, and some, you know, we have really clever people that work with, you know, with us. And they can all say, well, I can write an application that writes directly to hardware to do something. I'll say, okay, yeah, that's cute and all that. But is there a similar construct in the kernel? Yeah. And if there is, you know, it's really easy discussion. No, we're going to program the thing in the kernel, and we'll hardware accelerate what's in the kernel. And sometimes there's not. Sometimes the kernel doesn't have that construct. And we're like, okay, you know what we're going to do? We're going to work with the kernel community and create that construct in the kernel, and then we'll hardware accelerate the kernel. You know, because I inevitably, if you keep that pace going, um, you, you get this, this base of how networking should behave that's you know, universally vetted, not vetted by one company, but vetted by the universe. And so in that slide, what you see is the, you know, the Linux kernel just sits on top of you know, most of the hardware peripherals with standard device drivers. Yeah. In this you know, hardware accelerated you know, high performance networking piece, there's this big old device driver that we had to write. And that's this thing called off on the right, this switch HAL and switch D kind of piece. Yeah. And then Outside of that, everything else are reasonably standard user space applications. And I say reasonably standard because every once in a while we have a partner that, um, that wants to do something that they license separately. I'll, I'll look at CF Engine as a grant. Yeah, I see Puppet and Chef and OpenStack. Yeah, or, or CF Engine. They have an enterprise edition of CF Engine that they run for their you know, enterprise customers. So they, you know, we compile that and, and make it you know, work as a, as a package in our distribution. You know, apt-get CF Engine Enterprise comes down. 
But then, you know, obviously that's licensed through them. It's not, you know, it's not our code. We don't write it. It's not open source. You know, but so we're happy to provide that for all of our partners to get access to. Yeah, it makes total sense to me, and I think at Rackspace we we want the, the entire stack to be open because innovation gets freed up when when you do that, right? right. Whether it's open compute, whether it's uh, what you guys are doing, or whether it's open stack, right? right. Yeah, and if you look at the, I mean, so we had a couple of routing protocols off on the side. And tons of people are innovating in those spaces right now, and yeah. we're able to capture all of those innovations because we don't feel a massive, I mean, we test stuff out a lot, dramatically, but we're happy to take innovations that come in from other people as well. Tell me about your company, uh, how many people okay. are there? Yeah, so there's 35 people. It's, you know, it's pretty sharp right now. And what kind of skill sets? Um, a lot of X, X VMware kind of than Cisco people. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it, it's it's kind of a mix of, of networking people, operations people, network operations type people, um, and we we'll call them system programmers, people that understand the kernel, you know, and and, and then also deep hardware expertise, you know, and not just networking hardware, but CPU hardware, DRAM, file systems, all that kind of stuff. So we kind of wrap them all together, you know, in a, in an organization to leverage this. This ecosystem. Yeah, and you're funded by Andreessen. Tell me about how you're funded. Funding, right. So um, on the our Series A was from Andreessen and Battery Ventures, and so and they also participated in our seed round along with uh, Mendel Rosenblum and Diane Green, Ed Bunyan and Ellen Wang, who are all VMware founders, and uh, Peter Wagner, who was one of the, the big partners at Excel before he decided to leave. Very cool. Yeah, we we ended up with a great set of investors. They're they're great at, at giving us advice, and they're very engaged in what we're doing, so it's well, really cool. It sounds like you're off to the races. I, 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 I'm sure there's people at Rackspace who are going to watch this and <laughs> at least uh, consider you, because when it's one six, one eight, the cost, you know, to not consider you is uh, criminal, right? right. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Well, you know, it, it's funny because you talk about, I mean, there's the, the CapEx, which kind of, I would say, gets your foot in the door. Um, but inevitably, someone like Cisco could come in to rack, you know, rack, you guys are huge, right? So Cisco will come and say, hey, we'll give it to you for one-eighth the cost, right? They'll, they'll, they'll drop down on the cost curve side. But what we, we see as well is, is it's, what does it take to operate these things? How do I integrate into my back-end orchestration systems? And, and you know, customers, once, they, and kind of once you've had it, you never go back. Because you could tie, you know, statistics, you just connect things up to collect D, and you put on you know, one guy's tra tracking our environmentals and they want to monitor that. Somebody else is connecting network analytics. Someone's looking at health of the network and someone else is looking at routing protocol status. And they all drop down the appropriate monitoring tools on the platform, tied back to, you know, kind of industry standard connectors. It's really, it's really easy to administer and orchestrate around these things. Uh, how do people learn about you? What's your web address? Oh, uh, web's www.cumulusnetworks.com. Very creative. Um, and you go to the website, and there's a bunch of information there, and you know, architecture videos and intros and all that. Very cool. Thank you so much for coming out. Uh, Thank you, sir. I'm Appreciate it. Seeing what our teams uh, think about your technology stuff. So. Yeah, sounds good. Thank you very much. Thanks, Robert. <laughs>